The Ultimates is a bad book. I'm not sipping tea. Mark Millar is an insane person and has only become gradually more insane as time passes on. This book only further proves that. Instead of just setting one of the most influential superhero teams of all time in a modern setting for a new audience like intended, he turned all of them into a group of vile people that we're supposed to feel sorry for because of the original source material, and because they're realistic people. Characters that were once honorable and inspirations for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, were stripped down to being selfish, abusive, cold-blooded killers and psychopaths because Mark Millar thinks being edgy equals being revolutionary. That being said, I don't absolutely hate it. Well, no, I do. I do for a lot of reasons. A lot of people do for a lot of justifiable reasons. But then again, it's also so divisive. It doesn't hold a candle to a 616 counterpart, and neither does the universe as a whole. But I can pinpoint some qualities and give credit where credit is due. There are moments that I can look at and see why there's people that like this book. For what it is, it's a semi-decent story. If you just strip all the previous history and pretend that these characters aren't who they say they are, then it's okay. And plus on top of all that, Brian Hitch is a really fucking good artist. Like you can't take that away from him at all. Even if I can pinpoint traced elements or things that I think are traced, I have to admit that he does give his all in this book, especially with the action. Along with that and the scale, it's really exciting once it doesn't let up. There are indeed things that I like, but barely. I feel that I can be forgiving when it comes to bad media, mostly when I dig deeper and look behind its true intent. I can see potential, but that's all the ultimate universe is, wasted potential. At least, to me. The ultimate universe started- Why are you so fucking loud? It's fucking two in the morning. God damn. Bumass? The Ultimate Universe started out as a marketing strategy. In the late 1990s, Marvel was going through Chapter 11 bankruptcy and resorted to anything they could to profit off their characters, most notably selling movie rights to different distribution companies. The company took note that leading into the Y2K craze, their stream of continuity would be an issue with these new... Young adults. They were afraid that bright colors, fantastical costumes, and stories spanning across multiple mediums wasn't going to attract their intended audiences. Which, obviously, they didn't look at the Busta Rhymes video. It was the early 2000s. We were coming right off the back of the 90s where the coolest thing in the airwaves was dudes with guns and tight leather outfits. The revolution wasn't going to be televised, even though it totally was. Fight Club was every frat boy's favorite movie, and J-Lo made the world realize, Hey. So they decided to start from scratch with an all new universe. No in-story explanation for its existence, no interfering with past continuity, just straight up a new universe for a new and coming audience to enjoy. Ultimate Universe started out as this sort of, um, I, I don't know if kid friendly was, 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 is the best word for it, although that was part of the intent. But then we started to realize that the really the, the bigger intent was was sort of fan friendly, new fan friendly. So then editor in chief at Marvel, Joe, I helped one of the best Spider-Man writers completely fuck him. Desada put together a creative team of Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Millar. Bendis on fuck over on Ultimate Spider-Man with Mark Bagley and Millar on X-Men, along with Brian Hitch to reimagine. The book was more of a modern retelling told by way of a multi-million dollar movie in comic book form. Great business move, and in my opinion, a great premise. The problem? I was gonna go in order, but instead I'm gonna save the hurtful one for last. Everybody starts out being... fine, I guess? This was the first appearance of nigga. This Jay Fury, but he seemed to have the ranking general shtick down. He just has... no remorse. Whatsoever. S.H.I.E.L.D. is there to preserve human life, but there's plenty of times where missions he calls for end up in dozens of innocent casualties, and it's not brought up once from or to him besides a bigger incident. Hank and Janet Pym seemed like they were alright. Hank always seeming to be caught up in science, making any discovery that he can. He also showed up in Ultimate Spider-Man. Along with Jan having his back and being the heart of everything. But then as the book goes on, Hank just generally turns into an asshole because he gets fucked on by the Hulk. He literally mentally, verbally, and physically abuses his wife. One of these I commend him 
for. And it's just because he's insecure. Yeah, he gets his comeuppance, but there was no real reason for him to act out as such anyway. At least have a good reason to hit your wife. And he's apparently had a history of it. You don't say. He just ends up becoming a psychopath and expects to be forgiven. He causes all this trouble but is never officially dismissed. Being a big part of the second Ultimates book and eventually showing up in Ultimatum as well. Tony Stark is... A raging alcoholic? As am I. He's kind of just a modern day version of his Silver Age self. Another that's just kind of fine. But uh oh, what's that? Mark Millar is a dumbass. When the incident with Hank and Janet happens, and Betty reveals that history, he scolds her for not making it apparent. That's not on her, you smug fuck, it's on the guy that hired you. Either way, that type of thing is out of her control, so it's completely unnecessary for him to do. Captain America actually stays true to his roots for the most part. I was really enjoying the way they portrayed him in this modern day. Him having to come to face with the people left behind, seeing no point in living if everything he loved is gone, having to adapt to the new era, him being a subject amongst pop and general culture and universe, them doing PR for him and all, they make him this badass soldier throughout, really developing him the most, with him just wanting to do what he thinks is right throughout the whole book but still being this clueless old man. Then they fucked it. Mark Millar dropped his fat fucking nuts on the table, said have a good night ma and made him spew this for no reason. It had to be this line. Couldn't be anything actually clever. Couldn't be any boasting about himself. No. He had to sacrifice a full page spread so Cap can make a bigoted remark. I took flack simply because I was the one of us that attended a French convention shortly after that issue came out. Every French reader I had, I think, just instantly became alienated at that moment. I had to do a number of interviews, both live on stage and for various French magazines, which unfortunately wanted to bring this up. And I had to keep saying, look, this wasn't my idea, just Mark, I just drew it. I didn't know what the dialogue was going to be. No ideas at all. You fucking dickhead, you made him take one for the team for some shit that you did. Like you could say, Oh, it's just one page, it's not that big a deal. My problem is that it is one page. His reasoning is that it's just one of those stupid things that come to your head when you're crowning somebody. You know? No, Cap, I don't know. I can't say I've ever had to fight a shape-shifting space Nazi. Even if I did, there'd probably be way better things I'd come up with than that. Way too many napkins. I think Jane's the only character I can say I don't absolutely hate throughout the whole thing. I think it's because she's Asian. She's one of the only characters to look back on her faults and make the effort to change. Too bad she becomes an asshole in the second one and then... Yeah, we'll get back to cannibals in a minute. Thor, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Quicksilver, and Scarlet Witch are there as well, but they aren't really given as much character development until Ultimates 2. Though to be honest, I'm not against the idea of Thor being a freedom fighter. Though I am against what's eluded with Pietro and Wanda. They're just a bit too comfortable with each other as siblings. Betty Ross also plays a very important role and is pretty prominent, but I don't really care for her. She's honestly kind of a bitch. I'll get to why he deserves it in a second, but she's constantly knocking down Bruce at the slightest mishap, or is just constantly angry. Like, eat a fucking Snickers, lady. She also turns into She-Hulk in this universe, which one, you're not Jennifer Walters, and two, you're not Jennifer Walters. You're lucky I find you're kind of attractive. Let's just fucking get it over with. I love the Hulk with the passion in this book. Anytime the conversation is called for it, I expel my hatred onto it like he expels the semen of fluids onto everything. What they do to Bruce Banner and the Hulk is... offensive. Like, actually. Let's start off with Bruce. I don't care for Bruce very much here. He's just kind of this slimy, weaselly fuck who doesn't like to take responsibility for his own actions. He sits around moping and feeling sorry for himself because he's aware that everyone doesn't trust him due to the Hulk. Yeah, some characters are a bit mean-spirited to him for no good reason, but the banner I know wouldn't just sit around and take it up the ass. He'd stand up for himself because he knows the man he is better than anyone else. Whenever I read his dialogue, I can't do anything but get this sense that he has this whining, nasally annoying voice. I hear the voice from the Ultimate movie, but we'll get to that and the whole <coughs> mm. Mm. the hulk in the ultimate universe where the fuck do i start so let's correct the misconception when i hear people talk about the first time he turns into the hulk they say he does it just because he wanted to hunt down betty no that's the Hulk's intention. But it's not the reason Bruce decides to turn into the Hulk. He decides to fill himself up with a mix of Captain America's blood and the Hulk serum so that he can give the team something to fight in order for him not to feel like he's wasted his life on all of this. In his words, I missed being that big. So, he spends most of the book being a little bitch about it, trying to avoid it as much as possible, just to go out of his way to turn into the Hulk. And yeah, he does end up hunting Betty down because... 
Hulk, how are you doing? The Hulk is nothing but a goddamn child in this book. And not in the clever way of he's a child crying out to be loved because of the abuse he experienced as a child. He's quite literally just a big baby that needs his warm baba. Him turning into the Hulk is basically a tantrum because Betty went on a date with Freddie Prince Jr. He causes all this death and destruction because he's a juvenile hornball. Like, dude, I'm pretty horny a good amount of the time, but this is just stupid. He's so hormonally motivated that the only way they think to distract him is by Wasp flashing him. Oh, sorry, I mean a Mardi Gras special. He's also a psychopath, but what's new in the Ultimate Universe? And get this, on top of all that, he's a fucking cannibal. Yeah, he threatens to eat people all the time. He ends up eating the main villain of the book. Ultimate Human, he threatens to eat Tony. In the Hulk vs. Wolverine mini, he eats an entire herd of cattle. And when he talks about the experience to Betty, she's like fucking wet over it. I swear to God, Mark Millar just hates the Hulk. In one Ultimate Universe, he's a cannibal. In the other, he fucks his cousin. And the funny thing is, Hulk isn't even really separated from Bruce. At least, I don't think. I'm really confused whenever they try to explain it, it's kind of inconsistent. One explanation I've seen is that the Hulk is Bruce's ID, but that's just an excuse, it doesn't mean he's any less shit. With the whole Rampage incident, Bruce tries to blame Betty for the entire thing, and the team never calls him out on it. And once he's tried for everything and she tries to confront him, she's in a way guilt tripped into confessing her love for him. And he won't even say it back! Why? Oh, that was wicked! Cause he's embarrassed. It pains me to see him portrayed in such a way. I'm a big fan of the character of the Hulk in his lore, and I'll get into it more once I talk about the other pieces of media he's been in, because I feel that he's criminally misrepresented outside the comics. But it's just painstaking to see such a layered character turn into such a dick shit. There are moments after his death where he seems to feel regret from his actions as the Hulk and himself, but it's like, the damage is already done. There's no need for other writers to hastily try and pick up Malar's scraps. My problem isn't that it's different. If that was the issue, I wouldn't like anything that wasn't the comments. Except the Hulk, fuck him, dude. My problem is that it falls apart so much. My problem is that they all had this good stuff set up, from the premise to a good half of the team, to a good start of the book, and then the rug just gets pulled from under it all. It had all the material it needed aside from a good writer to be something great, but then it wasn't. Or, for a while it wasn't. It's really funny that this already has a one up on the book because of the name. Ultimates doesn't roll off the tongue as a team name and it doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense for in universe. In the middle of brand spanking new Ultimates 2, Lionsgate and Marvel Animation started on a production of an animated adaptation of the Ultimates. Somebody phoned me up and said uh, that they were making the animated uh, version of our comic and I really thought it was one of my friends playing a prank on me. And because uh, nobody at Marvel had mentioned it, and I was just sort of like grinning and sort of nodding and saying, Yeah, 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 of course, you know. And then they, they must have thought I was like, uh, you know, so nonchalant about this guy, I just didn't believe it. Let me tell you, it is leagues better than the book. Now, there are a lot of cons that it can't really help. It's not as good as the 2012 Avengers movie because, of course, it's not. <coughs> Because of the straight to DVD runtime, the focus on character that I thought the book had a grasp on, while still there isn't fleshed out as much as it could be, there's a lot shoved into it, and it's very tropey. There is a lot of room for criticism, but it's not too bad, not groundbreaking or anything. Oh shit, this is my first time reviewing a movie! Uh, I guess let me get you familiar with how these things will go. Format may change from time to time, but we'll get the groundwork set for now. I'll feature what I think are the most important elements of a film or medium, depending on what I go over. This video is already kind of long enough, so I won't spend as much time on it as I will in the future. I forgot to mention the story of the book. It doesn't really come into play until halfway in, like issue 8. But the movie doesn't waste any time, it actually sets up the conflict. That is a hostile craft. Thanks for the heads up! Jerk! In the book, Nick Fury sends Hawkeye and Black Widow out as black ops to take down what seem to be a bunch of office dwellers. Until later, it's revealed that they're an alien race called the Jatari. He drops a bomb on the team and then they just kind of get ready for the mission. And that's the rest of the book. You learn a bit about Cap's history with their leader, but then it's just the rest of the book. In here, everything ties together and it's not just thrown at you. Kleiser and the Chitauri are set up from the first scene. After Cap is frozen, S.H.I.E.L.D. is on a mission to look out for him in order to get Bruce Banner to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. In between taking care of Captain America, S.H.I.E.L.D. gets attacked by the Chitauri and then they put together the Avengers. Simple, it's not just thrown in your lap. Here, this was in your jacket. I wanted to make sure you got it back. Again, character development isn't as fleshed out, even not as much as in comparison to the book, but at least every appearance doesn't make you hate them. When there are those moments of being character focused, even if to be desired, they're still bearable. It's not like as the movie goes on and I keep seeing more of each of them, I wanna... You get me. They really wanted to give the audience that's returning from the book the opportunity to take the book and put it right up to your screen. So obviously since it's a direct adaptation, there's a lot directly taken from the book. Admittedly, some moments are done better in the book because they give them more room to breathe, but I guess they couldn't fit the runtime. But like, they didn't want to be the exact same and... <laughs> 
Can't blame you. The story is simplified for the better, just needed a bit more time. So yeah, movie one, book zero. Like I said, it's very tropey and not as good as its live action counterpart, but it's fitting. This is how I expect these characters to act and I get what's needed. Dialogues, uh, serviceable. Though admittedly, there are times where the movie gets a laugh or a chuckle out of me. It's what administers the serum. The schematics are also in your packet. Any questions? Any questions not about the Hulk? Though the writing isn't as heavy as the book, it's not anger inducing. And there's still the fact of these characters more serve to fit the narrative than anything, but they're still somewhat enjoyable to watch. I give a big part of the credit to the voice actors, not only because they at least make the dialogue memorable in my mind, but for the most part, they're also the voices I hear when I envision these characters. Fury's more straight to business and at least has a bit of outside concern, but there's this really fucking weird part. Professor Ross, where's Banner? He's supposed to be getting the serum ready. It's finished? He didn't say anything to me. Like, was he supposed to be part of the Chitauri here? His delivery is so stilted and robotic along with his demeanor, you'd think that was the case. But the next scene, he's normal again. Here, Hank's an asshole, but he's fully embraceable of it this time. But he's pathetic, and he's enjoyable to watch. He's not a psychopath, and here, he actually cares for his wife. Appearing to be neglectful, but jumps in at the slightest hint of danger in her direction. I shouldn't be saying I like the obnoxious asshole more than the actual asshole. Jen's good. She keeps her bubbly spirit here. She's kind of a hard character to get wrong, and I usually love seeing her on screen, for the most part. Tony Stark is... A raging alcoholic? And it's kind of funny. Iron Man, is it true you're not wearing pants under your armor? Come on, come on, we've been over all this before. It's true, and it does chafe. You know, he's supposed to be this smooth-ass playboy and all, but he's kind of shafted a lot of the time in this movie, both as Iron Man and Tony Stark. I kind of like the way it's handled. I may be looking too deep into it, but I kind of see it representing this shell. He's got this aura of a playboy, but he's prone to so many mistakes and shown to be kind of miserable when he's vulnerable. Okay, it is me looking way too deep into it. And another weird thing, he always talks about this fucking rib joint. Glad you could join us. Hey Cap, when we're done here, let's hit this rib joint I saw a few miles back. Cap's good. I don't have much to say different from how I described him in the book, except they don't screw it up. Hey Cap, looks like you... Could use some help. With his voice though, it's weird. His voice is fine, I saw it as Cap for a while, but it made me question the thing about Cap. See, I'm writing it myself, and as I thought about potential casting that I'd choose, I thought about his voice. The Earth's Mightiest Heroes version is my go-to, but I can't see him with that voice before the procedure. Thanks for the heads up. Cap, why aren't you defending yourself? The news is all over you, everyone thinks it was you. They say worse things about you. Yeah, and it's horrible. And the serum didn't just make his voice deeper. Here it's commanding and warm enough to be capped, but it's also not too burly. It's just a nitpick, even if it's not really a criticism. I don't know, I'm rambling, I'm fucking stupid. Let's move on. He barely shows up, but Thor is fun here too. Who's the chick with the hammer? Whoever she is, I hope she likes ribs. It's a good time whenever he's on screen. He's probably my favorite character out of all of them. Here, Black Widow was basically Maria Hilda Fury, except more lethal and active and very, very Russian. These amateurs, they're going to get us killed. This sparks a romance with Steve here, which I've always stuck with. Tactical nuke incoming! That is American. She's also given very little development here, but the scenes presented do her well. Betty's not unbearable here. She doesn't constantly have a Hulk-sized butt plug up her ass. Her frustration is warranted and she's not annoying about it. And she actually serves a purpose here. And man, am I highly fond of Bruce here. He's constantly tired of perceptions and underestimation and everyone's bullshit, and just generally tired as well. He actually keeps the logical part of Bruce's argument. He actually has a reason to turn into the Hulk. And there's a way better conflict with him having to go against the team. He actually has an arc here. He's so much better. I don't care how bare he is, just anything that's not the extra chromosome one. Movie 2, Book 0. I guess this one automatically goes to the movie since there's actual direction? I mean, it's kind of up to interpretation or more it doesn't really apply to the book, but I don't know. The voice had to do a pretty good job. Again, the script isn't as strong, but I don't think I'd remember so much if the energy of them wasn't there. I find it funny that Nolan North's not only here, but now he's Tony Stark in that Square Enix game. And that other guy. We love videos with boobies! Movie 3, Book 0. Though being a straight to DVD release, I don't think the animation's too bad. I like the art style and the designs of the characters generally stay the same, so I don't really have any complaints there. But I probably still gonna have to give it to the book. There's some wonky things with animation areas, but when are they not? I'm gonna let the underpaid Asian people off. Mike, they're Korean. Is that not Asian? The company's based in Seoul. 
Well, shit, my bad. And that's really all I can compare. There's not much to it. It's not that great of a movie and it's understandable why, but I do kind of recommend it for the fans or just for something to watch. But Mike, why have all this explanation build up in anticipation for something that's average at best? Well, because it goes back to my point about intention versus product. The product may have not been something that was extraordinary, but I can give the people behind it the credit that they deserve, just like I can do with the book. What was most important wasn't just getting every shot, it was making sure that it stayed true to the original work that was created. And I think people who see this will feel the way they did when they read the book, they'll be moved in those same ways, and I think they'll be getting the kinds of characters that they enjoyed in, uh, in the original series. The execution here shows that the ideas presented weren't too bad, they just needed to be done better. Here it kinda was. They were focused on telling a good story and giving the small audience that they had a story that they could enjoy, even giving the fans of the book what they wanted at the end of the day. Their intention was in the right place with this, Malara's wasn't, and I feel that they reached the goal they wanted. General Fury, how long before you can deploy another satellite? I won't sacrifice any more lives until we can guarantee the success of this mission. How long, General? Within the week. Then we will use that time to put a defense initiative in place. Jumpstart Project Avenger. General, how did the Nazis manage to acquire nuclear capabilities? With a little help. Germans called them Shatari. Extraterrestrials. Oh, come on. Little green men? They move around in three ships and like to buzz our nuclear power plants and military facilities. So, Fury, who you got in mind to lead this little scout troop? Kind of early for a promotion, isn't it, Pim? Still a little man banner. Now knock it off or I'm gonna squish you. Tony Stark's House of Ribs. <laughs>